Welcome everybody. Uh, today we have uh, to very uh, uh, fortunate to have Dr. Emery Kalema from Stellenbosch University. Uh, he's going to his uh, provisional title for the seminar is Space, Mobility and Displacement, the Mulele Rebellion in Postcolonial Congo. Uh, Dr. Kalema is a research fellow in the studies uh, in historical trauma and transformation at Stellenbosch. He holds a PhD in history from WITS. His research interests include power and politics, body and embodiment, violence, memory, trauma, and suffering. Um, again, thank you very much, Dr. Kalema, for sharing your work with us. And uh, as a housekeeping, as, well, uh, as I've already told you, it's uh, about 40 minutes, 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have a, a discussion of 20. And it's around, 30, around the 35 minute mark, I'll just send you a, a text on the, on the chat box. Okay. Over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. So uh, I'll start with two remarks. You know, uh, so first, uh, this, uh, this paper is a uh, part of my ongoing book project. Uh, uh, tentatively titled Violence and Memory, The Mulele Rebellion in Postcolonial Congo. As you can read from the slides, the book is structured around four themes. Um, and uh, the book is an exploration of suffering that people endure during the Mulele Rebellion, the reproduction of this suffering across time and its inscription in the imaginary of the survivors. Uh, secondly, for those of us who are not familiar with the history of the Congo, it is important to remember that the Mulele Rebellion, which is uh, at the heart of my presentation today, broke out during the Cold War and lasted from 1963 to 1968. Geographically, it took place in the western part of the Congo in this location called the Quilu region. And uh, so this is, this is the, the Congo uh, on the world map. The main goal of the rebellion was to reconquer the Congolese state from what the rebels call Belgian neo-colonial domination. This form of neo-colonialism, which in the view of the rebels was more insidious than traditional colonial rule, operated through Congolese intermediaries. The rebellion was led by Pierre Moulele. Moulele was one of the founders of the Parti Solidaire Africain, a Congolese national and socialist political party established in 1959 and served as the Minister of National Education for the Lumumba, Lumumba's government in June 1960. He was assassinated by the Mobutu regime in 1968. Like any war, the Moulele rebellion was a moment of extreme violence. Many people lost their lives and many others remain with all kinds of marks on their bodies, as you can see from uh, the image. So my apologies to you all, the images are you know, violent and the content of my talk, uh, my presentation is it will be a time you know, gruesome. So I'm sharing both the images and the content of uh, in this particular way, in response to one of the burning questions that animates my book project as a war, namely, how does one write about suffering in a way that doesn't compromise the suffering of the person on whom it is inflicted and of those uh, who are reading about this suffering? I hope that you will bear with me. Now, talking about the image, my focus this, uh, in this presentation won't be uh, on the physical scars that you see on the picture. It just I uh, undertook two years ago in my article uh, titled Scars, Mark Bodies and Suffering. My goal this afternoon is rather different. First, uh, I will show the relationship between the meaning of space, control over mob mobility, and the resulting displacement in the context of the Muleo rebellion I am discussing um, here. Uh, second, uh, this you know, overlaps with uh, my first goal, uh, is to show how suffering becomes deeply embedded within a violent space, the space, the space of the rebellion, through the forms and structuring of continual movement of people within that space. The argument I'm putting forward is that violent conflict in their nature always shatter the mental, temporal, and spatial frameworks by which people make sense of their lives. When conflict broke out in the Congo and were uh, accompanied by violence, terror, and actual physical movement, 
they ruptured previous logic of daily life that people used to lean on to give meaning to their existence. Not only this, this affects the physical bodies, it also affects the relationship of the self with the environment. So I will demonstrate this uh, empirically and in two times. So empirically, because uh, I still have to, you know, to, to conceptualize. Um, so I'll do it in two times. First, um, by looking at the conquest of the Quilu region by the rebels, uh, the reconfiguration of, uh, of the, the, that region and the regulation of movement within this same uh, you know, uh, conquer region. And second, by analyzing the phenomenon of continuously fleeing the conflict within this reconfigured and contested space. Having said this, um, let me get to the first part of my presentation with some chronology. In June 1963, Pierre Mulele uh, secretly returned from China where he went to learn about uh, you know, guerrilla warfare. By July, he reached the Quilu district to set up his maquis, the headquarters of, the, of his resistance movement. From July until September of the same year, he trained his, his partisans. And during the last quarter of uh, 1963, his followers engages in sporadic uh, 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 incursions against the positions held by the Congolese National Army. In January 1964, the rebels launched a major attack and the crisis spread across the region. The rebel movement grew to such an extent and was so successful that it soon uh, conquered and occupied a huge territory of about 300 kilometers from north to south and 100, 120 kilometers from east to west. So as you can see uh, you know, um, in blue on your, your right. By December 1963, the rebel leaders started to re reorganize the area they had conquered, but, uh, but the gradual fragmentation of the territory led to the creation of regional fiefdoms. To consolidate and extend their power within the region, the rebels divided the occupied territory into three zones, the north, the center, and the south, each zone being led by two uh, chefs de zone. Confronted by serious administrative problems, the rebels decided to reorganize the territory into five new zones in April 1964. So, and then uh, this time there will be uh, east, west, north, south, and center. And each zone was now, uh, you know, uh, run by one chef de zone. According to the rebel leaders, this new segmentation of the territory was key to how the rebellion was inscribing its power onto the landscape. Administrative structures based on the communist model were set up by the rebels' leaders to help them monitor the population under their jurisdiction. At the lowest level of the hierarchy, the rebels created the equipe or group of partisans. At the intermediary level, between the equipe and the zone, they created sous-direction, uh, in English, subcategories. And these structures were under the supreme authority of Mulele. But the occupation of the territory by the rebels, followed by its gradual fragmentation into regional fiefdoms, also raised numerous problems for the rebels, with security being one of these problems. From the onset, the rebels knew, uh, they knew that for their enterprise to succeed, they had to secure the huge chunk of land they took from the government. This is the reason why they came up with a number of initiatives. First, they mounted fierce resistance against government forces by guerrilla warfare. Uh, and this means so there were ambushes, eat and run attacks, uh, sabotage, as well as destruction of bridges and ferries. These tactics, which the rebels define as the cornerstone of the process for territorial fragmentation, prove very effective both in preventing the government forces from progressing towards the territories under rebel control and in isolating these territories from the rest of the region. There is evidence of this in the archives. But this wasn't all. To secure the rebel zone more efficiently, the rebels decided to station uh, security guards at strategic lo locations. 
And this is the second initiative the rebels undertook. Mostly appointed by force, these security guards were assigned absolute power over passengers. They had to control the exit and entry points of the rebel zone, also called the liberated or, or freeze, freed zone. Some of these security guards were positioned in trees as hidden uh, cameras to screen all individuals and assets entering all uh, and leaving the villages. As key tool in the protection of the freed zone, the security guard services uh, were subjected to uh, careful and re uh, regular inspections. The goal of these inspections was to ensure that the guards carried out their duties of controlling and monitoring the space where, where people were moving. Most rebel reports produced at the time put a strong emphasis on the word vigilance. The security guard were obliged to watch over the enemy without uh, respite. They were required to monitor and scrutinize every single road uh, ruthlessly. Those who failed to carry out their duties were punished brutally and replaced by others to prevent the passage and, uh, by the enemy. Those who ran away from the rebel position at the time, at the time remember the way in which the strategies put in place by the rebels affected the, the landscape. They described the space under rebel control as one transformed into barricades and into uh, enclosures with fixed entry and exit point. There was no contact with the outside world. This way of managing the space led to the creation of a monitoring network crisscrossed by a set of uh, uh, relays, and uh, each of which was uh, endowed uh, with absolute power over the people in motion. Yet the dissemination, the dissemination, no, sorry, the dissemination of individual security guard and strategic locations seemed not to be enough for the rebels. Driven by the strong desire of scrutinizing the movement of people under their control, the rebels made use of uh, other technologies of surveillance and, and documentation. One of these was to conceive new kinds of law and put them into place. The most important of these was introducing the compulsory carrying of a laissez-passer, travel document or passes in English, throughout the freed zone. Everyone should know that the rebellion was both a territorial and a surveillance machine. As during the colonial era, the laissez-passer was a legal document every person was required to carry on themselves when outside of the house. It played a key role in differentiating those who supported the rebellion from those who opposed it. At each checkpoint, the, re the rebels appointed people responsible for checking this document. Now, if the movement of people in the rebel zone was subjected to the compulsory carrying of, laissez of a laissez-passer, the possession of this document by no means guaranteed the freedom of, move of movement within this area. Aware of the fraud and traffic of fake documents, the rebels required travelers to validate their laissez-passer with a password in oral questioning. These passwords were uh, esoteric formulas that had to be learned off by, by heart. They were known only to a limited group of rebels within a given uh, radius. With these passwords, the inspectors at the checkpoint could easily differentiate the supporters of the rebellion from those known as counter-revolutionaries. These esoteric uh, formulas included a question and, uh, and answer set. This could change several times during the day, especially if the rebel position was under attack by the military, or if someone from the rebel zone had escaped toward the military position. This is why, for example, in June 1964, the rebels of Njili camp, located in the vicinity of Mbangi in Gungu, changed their passwords on the eve of the military attack. People traveling in the rebel area now had to be able to answer the question, what is two plus two with the contradictory nonsensical answer Saturday? The secret codes upon which the rebels relied were based, as we can see, on the circulation of knowledge. 
in a situation of uh, item uh, vulnerability caused by the rebel terror, it was often hard for people living in the rebel zone to find out newly coined passwords. The rebel, the rebel Spanish this lack of knowledge by inscribing the bodies of uh, an uh, uninitiated uh, travelers with their power. The rebel will seize them, blindfold them, and strip them naked before meticulously scrutinizing their orifices, the nose, the mouth, the ears, and the rectum. Afterward, the rebel will flog the uninitiated with a whip or a stick and scratch uh, signs and masks onto their naked skin uh, to show them uh, that the rebellion was also a graphic machine. At the end of this operation, the uninitiated uh, will be uh, entrusted to the care of uh, guardians who will accom accompany and watch them throughout the, uh, the journey. On the arrival at their destination, they will be assigned to the intelligence services who will continue to oversee them secret secretly. With, the, with these new ways of monitoring, the rebels were able to institute a strong field of visibility, visibility and su surveillance around the bodies of the uh, uninitiated travelers. The results of this was that many undocumented were killed with overwhelming and brute force. Now, the repositioning of, Congolese, of the Congolese army and, it, and its deployment in the Kulu region led to a new and complex reconfiguration of space. The rebels began to lose part of their position, and the huge the used territory under their the control was gradually reduced to a multiplicity of liberated pocket patches with government control clusters. The confrontation between the rebels and the government forces led to the, to the creation of, of other ambiguous forms of spaces. These were uh, mainly mission posts and villages that were located between the rebel and government areas, or which sometimes belong to both areas at the same time. The complexity of the dynamic between the rebels and the, mili the military within these areas led to intensification of strategies of control within the contested region. Roads leading to major centers and, uh, and besieged by the rebels were officially closed by the military. They subjected mobility on these roads to strict control. Mine were, mines were buried at strategic locations. Sometimes civilians were armed and instructed to control junctions. The military identified a uh, route used regularly by, the, by uh, rebel leaders and subjected them to special controls. The entire region was governed by a regime of curfews as it had been during the last month of Belgian colonial rule before independence. Like the rebellion, the state made extensive use of colonial technologies of surveillance to crack down its, uh, its enemies. Um, so there is uh, quite a number of uh, examples here you know, in, the, in the archive you know, to, to support uh, what I have just um, suggested. Um, for example, in the prefecture of, of Gungu, uh, you know, in April 1967, uh, so um, this prefecture was literally agreed. Entrances and exit were managed by special schedules. People's small gesture of everyday life, such as, such as walking, were monitored by a special regime of visibility. Now, to regulate the movement of people more effectively in the war zone, the military, in collaboration with local state authorities, introduced three new measures. The first established a regime of inspections, you know, just like um, in the, with the, the rebels. Based entirely on acts of coding and calculation, this regime collected debris of knowledge that could be captured in numbers. Its primary goal was to gain mastery over people to control their movement and to use the laws and Gattari's vocabulary to submit them to the spatial temporal framework of the state. As a technology of control and surveillance, the regime of, ins of inspections made extensive use of census data. The military, uh, accompanied by local authorities, visited, uh, the, I mean, they, they, they visited villages to uh, requisition the population. 
they will proceed with counting because they are the metric power. If some people were not present during the census, their relatives will be punished. Their bodies will literally be appropriated by the military or local state authorities. They will beat them, they will beat them up and make sure that in this act of beating, uh, there be left only a petrifying figure, a beneficiary of suffering, a drain power, and a mass that no longer appear to be the indication of anything substantial, if not the other theories of sadism, an abject death, deeply threatened with being a signifier and without a signifier. The second measure taken by the military and local state authorities intensified uh, the process for identifying people. Controls as checkpoints were tightened. The scrutiny of morphological details uh, of travelers became the prime focus of identity checkers. Instructions were given to the military to thoroughly analyze people's features. All the checkpoints were in possession of biological details and photographs of the main rebel leaders. In a confidential letter of the 27th of you know, October 1967, the head of Kikwit Intelligence Service des described Louis Kafungu, the rebel chief of staff, as a big man with an oval face and medium brown in color. His head slightly elongated. Is, he has a big nose with large nostrils. He has blue eyes, a wide mouth with thick lips. He is more or less one. Uh, 80 centimeters tall, and his face is bent like a bow. In 1968, this mode of identification will be generalized. The military and local state authorities will use it extensively to track down uh, insurgents. On the 24th of, Jan of January 1968, the head of Lozo sector urged everyone in, in his uh, uh, jurisdiction, including the chief of group of Bukma, community leaders and deputy chiefs of villages to clearly identify the faces of those passing through and to check their identities thoroughly. In February uh, 1968, the administrator of Gungu endorsed this decision. He insisted, however, that the identification of faces take precedence over the control of, I, uh, of ID documents. And this for a number of reasons. First, in his own estimation, most rebels use fake names to bypass the security systems. Second, so a real decoding of the face could restore the truth that had been uh, altered by the falsification of, uh, of ID document because the face as a component of the body was or is an important figure of the interpreting regime. The last measure insisted uh, instituted a mandatory carrying of a laissez passer as with the two first measures, this was an attempt by the Congolese state to insert itself into the landscape, just as the rebellion. The military wanted to fix the population tightly on, onto, the land, onto the landscape, distribute them, and monitor their daily movement. As in the case of the rebels, it is important to stress, however, that the possession of a laissez-passer in the government control area was by no means a guarantee of freedom of movement. In the context of extreme violence and deep distrust in which the region found itself, the possession or the non-possession of a laissez-passer seemed to have the same effect. People in motion were more often assumed to be part of the, the enemy camp, even if they uh, adequately conform with government regulations. This set of affairs uh, resulted in many people being killed. From 1964 to 1967, clashes were reported at checkpoints within uh, the contested zone. In an account about rebel activity in Kipuka, the head of this entity described these clashes as follows. At Vunda, he, he, he wrote, a man from Gazamba Kisumbu village who was passing near a bridge was arrested by the military. The military requested his ID. After having shown his papers, the military said that the man was a rebel. Despite all explanations, the man was beheaded and displayed on the bridge in such a way that all those who passed by this place saw the body and felt terrified. All the people of this area have now sought ref refuge in the bush where they are starving. 
whenever a truck passes, they must face eye, thinking that, uh, that it is a military vehicle. In 1967, a schoolboy was senselessly shot down by the military under the pretext that he lacked a laissez passer. So this is how the contested, the contested region was effectively transformed into a securitas grid by both the government and the rebel forces using technologies of surveillance, documentation, identification, and verification that seem to mirror each other and which turn any traveler into an enemy or traitor, traitor on both sides. Let me now turn to the second part of my presentation. The ongoing battle between the rebels and the military for effective control of the contested space led people to flee from their homes and seek refuge in the bush. Accustomed to living in villages, they were now subjected to new forms of life. For most of them, it was the first time they embraced this mode of living. Palmi Andyang, who spent three years in the bush between Ingundu and Mukedi, remembers the hardships of this new life. We were sleeping in rage, and she said, she said to me, having nothing to cover ourselves. The cold would penetrate uh, into the depth of our being. Papa, you have no idea. Ants and mosquitoes crawl onto us. We had no bed. We were sleeping on the ground with, as you can imagine, the great amount of uh, moisture in the ground. Mosquitoes were dancing in our ears. They were bit, biting us as they pleased. What could we do if only to pretend that there was nothing? In the morning, we would wake up and look for another place to hide ourselves. Papa, it was very hard. Sometimes I would feel like the sky and the earth were merging. It was hard. In the everyday experience by the population, um, of the contested zone, fleeing the conflict was a combination of several movement and speed. While linear at the beginning, movement uh, you know, could become curvilinear or circular in places only to fall back uh, once again into a linear format. So this concept conception of the line is what Valentin Yves Mugimbe has described in his meditations on alterity politics. It all consists, consisted of leaving one location and settling in another place only to be dislodged from there by terror and unexpected events. This used to happen regularly so that people were continuously moving or shifting. At intersections, they would turn around, sometimes without even noticing what they had done. Life itself took the form of a continuous journey during which people discovered not only their own vulnerability, but also an entire negation of their being. Frederic Yembele, a former student uh, of the Catholic mission of Intram, uh, I met him in uh, October 2013, compared the experience of fleeing the war to uh, that of uh, um, schizophrenia and the people involved in this process to a schizophrenic subject. Schizophrenia here is used metaphorically, not as a pathology. It defines schizophrenia in four ways. First, as painful, complex, and very confused moment during which one could hear a multiplicity of voices, while in reality, there were none. Second, a moment during which the body, terrified by war, will begin to lose its physical and mental balance in a very dramatic way. Third, as a, as a time during which people will be killed, people will be killed because they were drunk on war and its madness. Lastly, as a moment during which going and staying overlapped each other and meant the same thing as the price to pay was the same either way. The schizophrenic feeling that living or staying both meant the same thing was experienced by Leon Samu, Samuyala, a man who worked for the Institut National pour l'étude agronomique du Congo Belge at Kiyaka in 1964 after leaving his workplace as it was being surrounded and attacked by the rebels. A report drawn up by the human resource manager of the, that institute in uh, February 1964 um, gives a clear understanding of how living and staying as two contradictory phenomena um, overlap during the rebellion. 
Regarding Leon Samu Samuyala, wrote the human resource manager, he died approximately 20 kilometers from the station on Saturday, the 4th of January on his bike. He was fleeing to his village. In the, in the bend of the road, he came, up, he came up on a truck full of well-armed milit military. In his panic, he threw his bike to the ground and fled into the bush. The military assumed that he was one of the criminals and immediately shot him down. This was the first, the first reserve for the uh, schizophrenic subject during the rebellion. The echoes of this man's killing and the assassination of many others spread across the region. In this context of widespread panic, madness, and disconnectedness, it became unavoidable that people were separated. Men, women, and children would come from the South as a unified group, only to be separated from one another at a particular location because of the intensity of the war. They would flee from the center of the region to the North, only to undergo the same ordeal again. In most testimonies, these separations are described as some of the most painful moments of the experience of fleeing. Georgine Manqueta, whose separation from her siblings affected the death of her being, remembered how often her parents got tired. They frequently suffered from headaches. Her mother's blood pressure steadily increased. Each day brought more bad news. She heard about the loss of an uncle and sometimes the killing of a close relative. And all, all the sad news became embedded in her increasingly dreamlike world. Instead of offering a site for survival to, to the suffering body, dreams became the lieu par excellence of the production of suffering. Manqueta's dreams were dominated by dark and confusing images of descent into the bowels of the, of the earth. The imagination of the trip and the departure from home without hope of a return took shape in those dreams. In addition, her body was contorted by stress and anxiety. More and more often, she felt she could smell death. Her dreams were increasingly colonized, colonized by the image of falling trees. During the nights of the 24th and 20, 25th June 1965, these networks of metaphors intensified and expanded. Images of rivers and bathing dominated by drowning became ab abandoned in a nightmare. From an entry point, such as getting onto a ferry or walking in the water, emerged a maze of strains, blood, wailing, drownings, guns, guilt, le legal proceedings, blames, and the presence of the military. The mayhem would not stop coming closer. It was in uh, interspersed by collective mourning, snake bite, shadows of the dead, and the prosecution of the incense. My dreams, she said sadly, were about the sequence of forces of nature. I found myself sometimes in places where winds blew, the winds that uproot trees. There were insurmountable earthquakes and the presence of ghosts who came to pick me up for the eternal dwelling. The presence of death blood, mourning, snake bite, winds, and drownings as a network, as a network of metaphors and the proliferation in dreams was the result of what people experience on a daily basis. It shows in many ways the extent to which waves of terror, of terror cross the boundaries of life. In them, one can see the transposition of refracted experience of forms of disturbing force. Renal Kozelek, writing about dreams of terror and dreams in terror, state that when conventional behaviors is confronted with terror, this confrontation is transposed into an oppressive response within the dream. In such conditions, terror is not simply dreamed. The dreams are themselves components of terror. These kinds of dreams is suggest testify to an, uh, to an initially open, then later insidious terror and anticipate its violent intensification. They are not simply dreams of terror. They are above all dreams in terror, terror which uh, pursues mankind even into sleep, he concludes. This is particularly true for the rebellion in Congo since the space in which people were fleeing was so violent and the degree to which terror uh, escalated in this bewitched landscape 
was incommensurable. One example of this incommensurability of terror in the rebellion was an event witnessed on the 21st of August, 1964 by Dr. Cantarelli when he made official the result of an, an autopsy uh, performed on Onesim Diolo's corpse. Diolo had been murdered by the military when he attempted to prevent them from raping his wife. To erase traces of the murder, the military threw Diolo's body into the Quilu River. In his letter to the administrative officer, whose purpose was to investigate and document alleged, alleged brutality of the military sent for peacekeeping missions to the contested zone, Cantarelli wrote, I quote, on the basis of Mr. Loso's request, we performed an autopsy on the 4th of August in 1964 on the corpse of Onesim Diolo. We have made the following observations. The corpse was in a good state of conservation. There were outward signs of drawing, drawing distribu uh, distribution of the uh, hypothesis, um, hypothesis, skin characteristic, but lack of, uh, of fungus, uh, mucus uh, membranes in the nostrils and in the mouth. Maybe it was removed prior to transportation of the corpse to the hospital. Uh, there are uh, contusions in different parts of the body, especially in the frontoparietal right zone of the chest. The legs are closely bound together at the ankles. The testicles are tied, uh, are tied so tightly at their base with a lace that they are strangled. When we opened the rib cage, we found acute um, emphysema of the lungs. I Hyperare, these are medical terms, and uh, hematoma in the right frontoparietal region, as well as swelling of the brain. Basically, he concludes um, Onesim Diolo died by drowning. Before his death, however, he suffered several blows and abuse. So, this was, um, this is what life uh, was during uh, or reduced to during the rebellion. Now, uh, I wanted to um, talk about something else, you know, um, that it, dreams were not, I mean, not only the site of production of suffering, but they were also the site, uh, um, the location from where, I mean, people could project themselves into a free world, uh, the imagined world, a world without terror. But I, I see, I only, I'm only left with two minutes. So I won't uh, talk about this, and then I wanted to talk about the issues of unconsciousness. And uh, but um, I think I'm going to conclude now. Uh, in conclusion, throughout my presentation, I have described the relationship between space, control over mobility, and displacement in the context of the dramatic Mulero rebellion that took place in the 1960s in the 1960s in the Congo. I have also shown the way in which suffering was embedded in space through the forms and structuring of continuous movement of people within that space. The phenomenological understanding of what it was like for people to live under the conditions of forced mobility, contingent, and extreme exposure to violence, and the ways in which this was registered in dreams, social estrangement and, and exclusion, and the double bind of not being able to present oneself and testify to one's innocence or loyalty without a rising suspicion uh, that one is hiding complicity with uh, the other side are our all key component for understanding the embodiment of suffering in the context of the Mulele rebellion. The biopolitical strategies deployed by the government administration, the police and armed forces inherited uh, in part from a long colonial heritage, including road and river checkpoint camps and the use of per permits and various kinds of identification documents all contributed to the production of suffering. The third component to grasp uh, the centrality of space and displacement in the production of suffering is the question of how biopolitical forms, offices, terminologies, and techniques were transformed in the context of the rebellion and extreme disorder, which each side, the rebels and government forces, drawing upon a shared repertoire drawn from the colonial state and the practices of the rebellion against it. As a violent conflict, 
the Mulele Rebellion shattered the mental, temporal, and spatial frameworks which people used to make sense of their lives. Not only were their bodies, uh, the, the bodies of people affected, their relationship with the environment was also disturbed as physical mo movement introduced ruptures in the previous logics of daily life from which people used to make sense of their lives. Thank you so much for your attention. It was an excellent presentation, fascinating stuff. Um, now we have 20 minutes uh, for comments, questions. Uh, please uh, go ahead and uh, you can switch on your video if you want and ask the question or you can put use the hand app uh, in the chat box. Nigel, do you? Yes, uh, may, I, may I say something? Yeah. Yes, please, please go ahead. That's really very, very interesting. I, I mean, my, my questions are really asking for more background knowledge. Um, firstly, the, the motivation of these rebels seems a bit obscure. Um, you said that they had training or the leader had training in China, but what were their ambitions? Were they trying to create a secessionist state like Katanga, where they're trying to take over the whole of, of the Congo? Um, that's my uh, first question. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just to, they, they, they didn't seem to have a coherent ideology, which is why they're borrowing, it seems, the surveillance apparatus, apparatus or the surveillance aspirations of the colonial state. But it seems for no real purpose other than Ex, you know, <laughs> exercising the utmost power of surveillance, but towards what end eventually? Is it a mineral resource rich area? Is it a natural resource rich area? So please, just a bit more background. Thank you. Dr. Kalema, do you want to respond to the question or do you, should we take a round? Uh, whatever you can. Uh... I, I can respond. I mean, it's yeah. up to you. Yeah, and and oh, okay. if, if there's an ethnic component to, to this at all, if this, if this area has got a sort of a coherent ethnic identity. Okay. Maybe you can respond to this set of questions that the uh, okay. Professor okay. No, that, that's right. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so there's, a, I mean, uh, a lot has been written on the Munelo Rebellion and the focus has usually been on the ethnic identity. So there are books by um, Ludo Martens, uh, where, you know, they, I mean, even Benover again, where they, ex, you know, explore all these components of the ethnic identities. So Mulele was Mbun, and uh, the area where uh, he, uh, he launches his rebellion was mainly dominated, I mean, was mainly, uh, uh, so in, in that area, in terms of ethnicity, uh, so they, they are Mbun, they are uh, uh, Pende, um, and uh, of course there are also some other ethnicities, but these are the dominant ones. So the Mbun, and the, the Mbunda, and the Pende. So the Pende during the colonial era are those who you know, protested and they also killed some, some of the, uh, white colonial officers who were going to get a, a taxi. So you have those ethnic identities and Mulele wanted to mobilize ethnicity uh, so that he could, uh, with the hope that he could succeed. Because I mean, uh, what's the best thing, at least from his own understanding to start a rebellion other than in your own uh, you know, um, area. So let's say, uh, because uh, the idea was that his own people were going to protect him. And, if, and, of, and th that was true because they protected him for five years until uh, he had to leave and went to, to Brazzaville. Now, I think uh, in terms of ideology, so, you know, it's, uh, he was trained and he had these uh, powerful ideas. So he, he really wanted to create something uh, which could be the alternative of the colonial regime or the, the government would, uh, that was in place back then, you know, with the, the government was supported by Mobutu and uh, the West and, and so forth. So he wanted something different from, from what was, was then. But then when he came, he, 
you know, it trained people, but I mean, you, as a leader, you, all, you don't always have control over everything. You know, you have a group of people who are in a mission somewhere and they do all this stuff. And in the, in the literature, there's always this uh, divide between, was it a rebellion or a revolution? So many believe that it was a revolution. But when I read the archives, these archives were produced by the rebels themselves, not the government. So you can see the details of looting and all those abuses, which in a sense doesn't necessarily, so you can see that, um, I mean, you can't always control, you know, people. I mean, they, they can always be, um, you know, people among them who will always, you know, derail from the, the, main, the, main, the main course. And um, so that's also part of the contradiction. So they are hoping for something uh, else, but they are also drawing from the, uh, you know, colonial, you know, practices. And I think that's interesting as in terms of, um, you know, contradiction. But uh, again, it, it's war. You you have uh, you have secure a huge, a huge chunk of space or, or, or land you have to protect that land. And uh, what do you do? You have to, so I, I think, I, I mean, that's what they, um, they, they try to do. But then, uh, so it's in the Western part of the country. So that region has nothing to do with minerals. So the minerals, it's usually in the Eastern part of the country. So it's, uh, I mean, economically, it's, uh, I mean, it's agricultural land, you know, territory, so, and yeah, so there uh, they were no mineral and there were no intention of, you know, um, uh, whatsoever like it is now in the Eastern, Eastern part of the country. Clement, we have another question from okay. our colleague, uh, Thierry uh, Rousset. Thierry, what, what, can you just uh, ask the question? And then after that, Dr. Cor. Uh, yeah, just sorry, sorry about the background. Um, thanks, thanks for the talk. I, I was just wondering about the links with the uh, Simba Rebellion that was happening at the same time uh, and, and whether the, the kinds of modes of violence, the modes of surveillance, uh, whether that took different forms there um, and whether the repercussions and scars and markings um, that, that they follow similar patterns there or, or were those different in any particular way? Thanks. There is an, another question, Dr. Kalema. Would you like to maybe we'll collect the next question as well and you can answer both of them together? Yes, yes, please. Uh, if you go ahead, Dr. Hello, uh, Emery. Fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful and thoughtful presentation. Uh, and I may be completely wrong because I missed, unfortunately, the first two, three minutes of your talk. But uh, it seemed to me, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed to me that Gilles Deleuze's shadow hovers over the entire presentation. I particularly liked the kind of notion of the revolution as a graphic machine. And uh, I was thinking particularly of faciality machine in Dalus, right? Okay. And faciality machine. Okay, faciality. Right, right? And, and I was thinking that the way uh, Dalus uh, think about intensity and identificatory drive, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, kind of work in, 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 under that sign in, in some sense. But, but I was, I understand that owing to constraints of time, we could not um, hear very, very significant parts of your uh, argument and particularly in relation to bestiality and the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was also kind of thinking about, so if you could just talk a little bit about where you want to push this. And uh, I'm particularly thinking in relation to Dalus because the work, the specific work that the metaphoricity of schizophrenia does in your uh, paper uh, seems to be allied with but also quite opposed to the Dalusian notion of uh, schizophrenia as uh, living on the uh, condition of, of the intense. So I, I'm, uh, it's, it's not a properly formulated question because I couldn't hear the full argument but I hope uh, I've given you enough clues to uh, kind of you know encourage you to speak a little more about these issues. It was just fascinating. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dr. Ko. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so about the Simba, yes, the Simba rebellion was happening at the same time, and it was in the eastern part of the country, and um, and uh, at least I would say, I mean, so those who were written on Mulele, I mean, people like um, Ludo Martens seem not to believe that they were interconnected, you know, especially ideologically, because so Mulele, at least you could see that there were some sort of training, so, and people had some rules to follow. Uh, there were prisons, those who were, not aligning uh, with uh, what you were saying were in uh, you know in prison and all those kind of things um so i, I think now the the work that needs to be done would be to uh because well i know that the simba rebellion you know existed at the same time but i haven't uh, i still have to go and look into details you know to see um, this, but what I know from what the novel again has written, um, there were also abuses um, that were happening in the western, in the eastern part of the country. You know, with the Simba and uh, and all those, and, and with the Simba um, rebellion. Now, in terms of um, Deleuze, um I think, yes, oh, you, you missed the first part where I said that I was trying to present things, you know, empirically, and then there, there, there was time where I, mean, I would be, I would conceptualize, um, I mean, the, the paper itself. So, um, and with time constraint, you can't always, you know, uh, talk about everything. So the paper, it's, uh, it's I mean, it's divided into four parts. So the argument is a four-part argument. So I only share two parts, which was also incomplete because of time. So in the first part, which is the, um, the occupation of territory, as I showed, uh, it's what I was trying to, to describe, those practices and how, you know, they fully, I mean, each uh, side is drawing from the same repertoire. repertoire. The second part, it's the, the one on fleeing. So um, there are just a number of uh, things that I didn't share. So fleeing um, the conflict, the, the notion of schizophrenia, which uh, I'm drawing from Deleuze, uh, as you pointed out, it's also um, against uh, the Deleuze. Um, and then there's the idea of bestiality and in the, with the idea of bestiality, there are, I think, four, um, four elements. Um, uh, if you can allow me to, let me get my, yes. So, um, yes. So there are three um, elements in the, the idea of, uh, of, um, of bestiality. First, it's about emotions. Um, secondly, it's about bestiality in relation to submission and bestiality in relation to domestication. So these are the you know, three ideas I wanted to unpack in relation to the idea of, of bestiality. Then uh, there is a whole section on periphery as, a friction, as, as, a, as friction. You know, here I only show the, the uh, the contested area, right? And then now when people are leaving that contested area, they are going to the periphery, they are also facing an, a lot of problems. They are not being accepted. Why? Because they're coming from that region. And here we can bring the question, the notion of identity politics, you know, ethnic uh, in politics, because they are moon, they are being labeled as certain, you know, with those. And it's also creating problems. Most of them, many of them are, are being killed. And even that um, periphery is also crisscross. There are checkpoints everywhere because it's war. That's the context. And now the last part is about the refugee camp as, um, as a site of exclusion. So if they come to the periphery, they are facing all those kinds of problems. Now where they are going to uh, you know, the refugee camp, those refugee camps were uh, both in the contested area zone and in the periphery, they are being excluded as well. So 
why? Because they are labeled as the rebels. Mm. So they will go to the market and here in the, the I'm using the concept of biopolitics of exclusion. So in that uh, section, so they are, it's, it's completely different from the Nazis. So um, they are not killing them, but they are making life very, very hard for them so that in the end they will decide to leave. And in the archive, you can see that, you know, the evidence that people are uh, asking so that they can be, uh, you know, distributed. That's the term that they use uh, within the, the region, you know, to their relatives so that they, at least they can have, uh, be in, uh, in security. Um, uh, they can at least live you know, some, some sort of life, some, some kind of normalcy. And uh, when they go to the market, because they can't give them food, even, even, if they, even though the, 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 the government said that, yes, you have to feed the, those people because they don't have food, give them manioc, give them food, uh, whatsoever. But people are not giving them. And the government doesn't have money to feed them either. So now when they go to the market to buy, prices are going up. Why? Because they are <laughs> they are the so-called, I mean, they are the refugees. So th this is the terrain where I am operating. Uh, and of course, uh, Deleuze, um, uh, there is, uh, so there's Foucault, there is Eric Fassin, um, so all these, trying to work with them, but also at the same time, sh you know, showing what is, uh, what is different. But I take your point that the faciality machine and the graphic machines are, you know, interesting concept. And then I will rework this with, in relation to what I suggested. Uh, well, I no, no, fascinating. Thank you. I, I was just kind of, I was just curious about uh, kind of what happens when you uh, move from the identificatory scope of faciality machine to uh, the kind of much diffused notion of schizophrenia when because you are attaching to schizophrenia a very different semantic register than what usually Deleuze would, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you talk about friction. There is an interesting and productive friction. It was just like a side note for myself. So thank you for saying, uh, allowing me to say it aloud, but uh, fascinating work. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kaur, for the questions. Uh, questions, comments? We have another couple of minutes before we will disperse. Mm -hmm. Quick question. I, I have a short question, Dr. Kalema. I was just wondering, I was very fascinated by that component, that little uh, bit where, which you could not elaborate on because of lack of time around the, how, how dreams become components of terror, dreams as terror. Uh, there is one part where you mentioned this. So I was just wondering again, this is uh, around the techniques of this, this dream as terror imagination and how is it, because it's, it's a constantly changing landscape as you're showing, you know, from fleeing from, from, from uh, the, the, the space of the rebellion, uh, which shares, you know, techniques with the state, then the fleeing then the, uh, uh, the departure from refugee camps. So there's a constant change in terms of the material or the landscape around which uh, these kind of dreams are taking place. I was wondering if there, there are, uh, the dream as terror actually changes its forms according to the different movement, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, yes, uh, thank you for that. Um... So what I did in the, uh, what I'm doing in the chapter is, yes, you know, those are uh, different locations within the, you know, the space war zone and now, and, and then I, I look at in the periphery to understand what kind of dreams, you know, the people in the periphery were having. So both, you know, those who, have, who, who fled the rebellion and those who were in the periphery normally. Um, so uh, at the very beginning, at least that what they told, told me that they were, because I mean, you just fled the, 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 the war. So obviously you are still traumatized um, and those images are still part and parcel of yourself. Um, and um, uh, so that's what I, um, so there were some sort of similarities, you know, in terms of uh, the, uh, let, let, 
the word what could be the word terrorism if I, I mean if I can put it that way in some of those uh, you know um, dreams um, but now um, the more they stayed I mean the longer they stayed in the periphery then the resistor also started to be, I oh. mean, to, to, to change uh, at some point so that's what I tried to Mm. to trace in the in the in the within the chapter but it would be interesting to um to go deeper into into that and see uh, how they are changing according to those landscapes i try to do that maybe it's something or any other historians you know can also take up uh, the challenge thank you dr kalema for a fascinating paper and uh, would love to read it uh, when it's ready uh, and thank you for sharing your time and work with us. Uh, and thank you, everybody. So we are at the end of our uh, scheduled hour. Uh, and I know colleagues have other classes to, uh, to take. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for everybody for participating. And uh, hope to see you next Wednesday again.